Okay, well, I'll start while you are um, getting stuff together. Can you, uh, is the recording on? Everybody there? Good, happy. Okay, so um, welcome. You've already been uh, to the best part of this building, right? Which is the sixth floor. Maybe you took a glimpse outside. We have excellent vision and graphics faculty in this department. That's why you see what you see is an excellent simulation of beautiful weather. It is really raining and cloudy outside, and it's about 20 degrees, right? But we're so skilled. Anyway, uh, attempts at humor aside, you have been outside, right? You see, right? And uh, the terrace outside, you probably will have lunch, is the best feature of this building. Um, the entrance to the building, not so much. Um, but actually, it is a very nice building, and uh, this is the house of the School of ICS, Information Computer Science, and you have applied and been accepted to the Computer Science program. So this floor and the floor above it is where most of computer science is. Right? So if you decide to come here, which we hope you will, you will wind up spending lots of time in these two floors and maybe a few other buildings where a few other labs are. The majority is here. Now, I am Gene Sudik. Uh, I am the Vice Chair for Graduate Studies uh, in the Computer Science Department. Normally, this presentation is given by the Chair, but the Chair couldn't be here. But anyway, since you're graduate type folks, I'm probably better choice for presentation anyway. So, I'll give you a few highlights, some statistics. So, this uh, school was founded, you know, in ancient prehistory. Uh, dinosaurs roamed the earth in 1968. Uh, the building did not look like this in 1968. If you walk around campus, you'll see a lot of sort of these slatted buildings that look like medium security prisons. They were like the top of architectural chic at the time. And um, they still, uh, you know, a few of them are on campus. I, I uh, have an office in one of them. They're called, this planet, they're called Planet of the Apes buildings because one of them was used for filming Planet of the Apes Part Two, the humanities building. Tellingly, it was the headquarters of the apes. <laughs> right, so, uh, in two th so this, from 1968 to 2002, uh, the computer science uh, programs and faculty were housed in a department that very weirdly reported to no school. It was just a self-standing department. They reported to the big cheeses on this campus. And in 2002, recognizing the growth and the, the breadth of computer science and popularity of it, of it all, uh, a school was created. It wasn't the first school in the nation. It's the first school in California of its kind. Uh, you may have heard of Georgia Tech and CMU. They, were, they created schools of computer science prior to us. Um, and by now, 16 years later, there are tons of universities both here and abroad that have bona fide schools of computer science uh, like, sort of like ours. So your NCS department, you may be interested in some of this and may be bored by some of this. Um, as far as our graduate program, right? Uh, if you trust the US News and World Report, some people do, some people don't. I make no judgment. The most recent one says that we are, uh, let's see, 29. Now, there's a pack. You know, if you've seen those, it's ranked by packs. So there's a pack that said it between 28 and 32. The way we appear is 29, but there is like several of them. Um, now, our fraternal departments in engineering, computer engineering related programs, and ECS are quite a bit lower than us. We are also 13th in the CS graduate program um, among public universities in the US. According to another ranking, reputable ranking by a non-commercial organization, Max Planck Institute in Germany, um, we are 20th worldwide. Shanghai ranking 2015, I don't remember, don't have more recent, puts us on 29th, similar to US News and World Report, and 19th in the US. CSRankings.org puts us to 20th, and Microsoft Academic Search, which ranks faculty research output, okay? Not the graduate program, but faculty research, uh, ranks us 19th in uh, field impact. And in some areas, as you might already know or will find out, uh, we are ranked even higher. Um, some, for example, databases, uh, data mining, uh, data science, AI, those kind of uh, hardware and architecture, multimedia. Those, those uh, areas are very well represented here, and the faculty are super active with large research groups, lots of funding, and they're ranked quite a bit higher. 19th is overall. Now we have several majors. These are undergraduate majors. We offer a very popular computer science major. Why am I telling you this? Because as grad students, sometimes you will have to interact with those creatures that you wear now, you wear before or are still now. They're called undergrads. 
And we have lots of them. And you will interact with them in a variety of ways, maybe as part of your research, maybe as part of being a TA or reader. Okay? And that's something every graduate student has to do for at least a little bit. It offers many tracks and concentrations at the undergraduate level. Uh, there's also a very popular computer science and engineering major. So this is a little bit of a solid kind of hybrid between computer science and engineering. They take more uh, architecture style courses and more embedded system style courses, but also uh, quite a bit of CS. And then we also have a department of informatics on the fifth floor um, that uh, deals with HCI, ethnography, uh, computer supported cooperative work, and software engineering. In those areas, uh, we have a, also a lively program in informatics, both grad and undergrad. And with them, we also run a software engineering major and a computer game science major. Yeah, don't ask. People like gaming. This is also, by the way, the, you know, the, the world headquarters, right? Blizzard is here in Irvine. So if that means nothing to you, you're not a gamer. Well, neither am I. So. Um, graduate studies. We offer, as you, as you already know, MS and PhD programs in computer science and with tons of different yeah, usual suspects, right? The areas. I'm not going to recite every single area. It's not an exhaustive list. In addition to that, we have a joint program with the School of Engineering called Network Systems. If you've never heard of it, never mind. There are only usually a few students. There may be one of you here that, is, uh, that came in for that program. That program emphasizes, is again like a hybrid, right? It emphasizes networking and communications. Okay? So, for example, I supervise one or two students uh, at a time from that program because I, my own area is security, privacy, cryptography, and that has a lot of uh, relevance to networking. Okay? Some other faculty in, uh, who also do communications and networking here in CS tend to supervise one or two students from that program. We have a large undergraduate enrollment, and it keeps on growing. This actually, these numbers are actually one year old. So uh, I'm sorry I, didn't get, I, I forgot to update it. So they're actually uh, uh, appreciably higher now. But a year ago, it was 2,400 undergraduates, about 130 PhD students. Now, the number of faculty is roughly 45, or at least it was 45. Now it's about 47. So you can see it's about three, three PhD students per faculty, but uh, you will see it's not a smooth line. Uh, some faculty have one student, you know, if they're in a particular area which, where they don't need, they have particular needs for students or they don't have funding. And then some faculty will have 12 or more. All right, the, the average is more like uh, amongst research active faculty, which is the majority, uh, the average I would say is about five. And that's where I am, squarely at five. Uh, we also have a bunch of MS students. All right, again, MS students uh, take the same courses as PhD students, generally, graduate courses. Uh, you, will find, you will find them as your peers. Uh, they typically stay for a lot less time here, right? They stay for a year and a half or so, maybe two years. Uh, we offer two MS programs. One of them is not listed here. So this is a, mass, a regular master's in computer science. We also, since last fall, uh, started offering a professional master's in computer science program, which is a much more hands-on. Okay? So this MS is more like deeper, into going deeper into the subject that you cover as an undergrad. In computer science, the MS program wants to put, put you out there and make you like, employable right away, right? Attractive to, attractive to employers. So slightly different philosophy, same roughly number of courses, but the programs are firewalled from each other. The professional master's program has its own set of courses. You will not, never be enrolled in those courses, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So just to brag a little bit about our faculty, because Really, you know, of course, you didn't come here for the weather, right? Um, we have, well, it says 43, this is actually 45, and by the end of this year, academic year, academic year, by the way, ends on June 30th, right? So by the end of this academic year, we will have quite a few more. My hope is we'll have about 50, because we have, actually, at this very time, we have several active faculty searches going on, a uh, number of pos open positions. So. Uh, there's 45 faculty members, and uh, there are a few of them that are sort of called uh, lecturer, uh, sorry, non-lecturer appointments. Uh, let's, a few accolades. So we have one uh, National Academy of Engineering member, Michael Carey. I don't know if he's on your schedule, but he's a pretty well-known worldwide kind of database. Class of uh, um, research and adaptivity people have looked at. And uh, we're, we're trying to learn from biology in terms of how you look at living organisms and how they can actually adapt. So that's kind of one one topic they've been working on. 
And we're trying to, uh, to apply that in two specific contexts. One is in what we call a self-aware chips. So you, know, you get these very sophisticated chips today, many core architectures, CPUs, GPUs, um, and uh, they have to deal with a, a wide range of uh, workloads. They deal with uh, energy budgets. And uh, to try and make them more efficient, we're trying to look at developing uh, adaptive reflective middleware layer that is self-aware. So it's a software mechanism that monitors the state of the chip, the state of the environment, the state of the workload, and does cool things on, on chip and in the software. So that's one major theme. The second area is in the area of what we call as healthcare IoT. So we're seeing this convergence of uh, information technology in healthcare. Right. Not just in medical records, but uh, you've heard of the quantified self. You know, we're all, how many of you have Fitbits or Apple Watches? Raise your hand, right? So we're already tracking ourselves quite a bit. And the idea is, can we start using some of that technology to do predictive analytics to help um, healthcare providers deal with impending um, heart diseases or uh, pregnant women who are you know, trying to take better care of themselves during pregnancy? Or another topic we've been looking at, which we started a, a trial with the medical school, is in the notion of quantifying pain. So let's take a minute to think about that. You know, when you get uh, hurt or you go to the doctor they, or nurse, they say, you know, what's your pain level from 0 to 10? Highly subjective. What does that even mean, right? You know, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm feeling good, so I don't feel pain. Or maybe you're a Marine. You've just come back from, you know, deployment. And for you, your pain threshold is very different. So the point is that it's very hard to quantify that. But it turns out that there have been some medical studies done that show how you can quali quantify some of that by looking at uh, facial mus muscle dysplasia. You know, you tend to squirm if you're in pain. And you can correlate that with some body vitals. You can look at blood oxygenation level, uh, galvanic sin response, and you can fuse all of that to build a model, individual, individual model for a person, and then use that to quantify pain. So that's another project we've done. So that's sort of the second pillar of the research we have, which is in the area of healthcare IoT. And the third pillar is in the area of what we call as a new class of computing platforms called neuromorphic architectures. Anyone heard of that? Right? It's this, uh, this domain where we're seeing that uh, many of our computing platforms, like this thing, they're extremely energy limited and highly inefficient for what they do. But if you look at the human brain, or any living organism in, in general, uh, they can do certain kinds of computations in a much more energy efficient manner. If you think of the amount of energy it takes to power your brain, right? it's not a fair comparison, but nevertheless. So there's this uh, holy grail where we want to build new computing engines that can try and model some of the neurological brain processes and thereby come up with new computing platforms. And indeed, today we have already, uh, with IBM and Intel, two platforms that they've already announced, True North from IBM. And Intel um, announced a many core architecture last month called Loihi. I think they've run out of all the peaks. You know, they, they went for a while with all the peaks in California, now they're going underground. This is a underwater volcano in the Hawaiian Islands, I guess. So it's the Loihi platform. It's a new many core neuromorphic platform that uses spiking neural networks as a model of computation. A lot of cool stuff there, we believe, uh, that can help us do uh, navigation, uh, auto autonomous learning, and many of these things a lot more efficiently. So that's the, sort of the third platform. And just to wrap up, um, the group has about maybe eight to 10 PhD students. Uh, some are co-advised with uh, faculty here, like uh, Professor Marco Leverado, whose exam, student's exam I have to go to in a minute, <laughs> and uh, colleagues in cognitive uh, sciences. So we're doing quite a bit with uh, Professor Jeff Kritschmar and Professor Emery Nefchi, who work on looking at um, modeling different brain functions and seeing how you might uh, apply those in an engineering context. So that's about it. Um, I hope to come back and see you guys at lunch, but I really have to run. So I'm sorry, I, I don't want to be late because the student, Dilaram, she's going to be really worried. So with that, I'll, uh, I'm done. Enjoy. Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Samir, I'm probably the most junior faculty in this department, but that's going to change in a few months, like Jean, Jean said so, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but I'm going to be giving you an overview of uh, the AI and machine learning part of this, this lab. Uh, 
of this department. I know some of you are applying solely to work with machine learning faculty, some are not, but as you'll realize that machine learning sort of is very, uh, can get into anything and you might end up doing machine learning if you come here. So just to sort of make the obvious statement, machine learning is pretty much everywhere. You, when you use your email, when you're looking at images, anything online sort of goes through some pipeline of machine learning somewhere in the background. It used to be a lot more hidden, but now it's becoming much more front-facing. So Watson, maybe six, seven years ago, but now AlphaGo, all of these AI agents, machine learning agents are playing these games that we really like to play. They're doing it better than us. Now that we don't have, now that the games are not fun anymore, we are watching movies and they tell us what movies to watch, what to do with all the time that we have. It's going to be, it's already in all of our phones, it's going to be in our cars. So basically machine learning is everywhere. So what is sort of unique to UCI that sort of makes us really strong in machine learning? We'll be looking at it from a few different aspects, but here's sort of a somewhat fact sheet. We have the faculty here are top notch uh, in the country, internationally as well. Um, they are in the editorial boards and committees of all major AI machine learning journals and conferences. So if you've heard of NIPS, ICML, blah, 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 we are all into it. Uh, because of what we do, we get funded funding from pretty much everywhere, DARPA, NSF, NIH, um, industry labs as well. Uh, we have this UCI machine learning repository, which has historically given us a lot of credence in, in machine learning. So we have a lot of research, but also support the community uh, very well. Um, the PhDs who've done AI machine learning have gone on to do lots of interesting things as well. So they've got best paper awards in all these co conferences, but then uh, they've also gone on to become faculty in a bunch of other schools as well. So when you are visiting some of them, you might meet our alumni. Um, or if you decide not to go to grad school, even if you go to companies, you'll see we, we are pretty much everywhere, um, so including places like DeepMind that, that did the AlphaGo stuff, uh, and Apple, Facebook, and things like that. Um, so if you think about what machine learning sort of involves, a lot of it resides in computer science, where you have statistical learning, deep learning, applications to text, to vision, and sort of creating more AI-like agents. And we have a lot of strength in, in this part. Um, so these are all the faculty members. You'll see a version of me there. Um, but these are all the other faculty members who do all kinds of different things. Um, there are people who do Alex and Rina, who do a lot of approximate reasoning. Boric does some of this, but also text and natural language. I've been doing a lot of natural language. Eric and Charles, Eric joined us last year um, from Brown. They, they do a lot of computer vision, and we have this whole set of faculty that do computational biology. There are also other applications like health and things that I'm not gonna go into. Um, the other aspect of machine learning is also sort of interdisciplinary. So there is a lot of statistics and mathematics, a lot of cognitive science, some of which Nick talked about a lot of engineering that comes in. And what is nice about UCI is that all of these different departments have people who do machine learning in there. This is sort of unique to UCI. They're not, not every department has people doing machine learning in, and not every university has people doing machine learning in other departments, but UCI has a lot of them uh, as well. There's also the other side, sort of more applications where there are applications in the business school, applications in social sciences, and applications in natural sciences. And again, at UCI, we have a lot of faculty in all of these departments. Even places like social sciences, I've been having these really interesting conversations talking about Bayesian latent variable models and stuff like that from people in criminology and political science that you otherwise don't expect to be mathematically trained. So it's actually been really, really nice. Uh, and so this is sort of some of the other faculty in other departments. This is not the complete list, but people in statistics, uh, people in cognitive science and linguistics, they study a lot of how humans think and how humans apply machine learning to things. People in sociology and social sciences, physics, mathematics, and all of these areas. And partly 
the way you find out that there are all these areas is UCI also has a bunch of what we call centers of research. So we have the Center for Machine Learning, um, where a lot of machine learning people stay. But there's also the UCI Data Science Initiative, which is sort of statistics and computer science, and then a lot of applications to a bunch of departments. Uh, there's the Institute for Genomics and Bioinformatics that does a lot of machine learning in computational biology. So Pierre Baldi and a bunch of people have been doing a lot of exciting research there. There's the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences, and it has their own PhD program as well, where they're trying to use mathematics, statistics, and machine learning to try to model how people behave. Right? Um, and so there are connections, and you, you probably can't see it, but they're connections to anthropology, sociology, political science, but also to economics and cognitive systems and all of psychology and so on. Uh, partly because we have so many machine learning faculty all over campus, it ends up being this really active hub of research, where even people in all of Southern California region often come to UCI to basically meet and talk to each other. So just in the past year, or I guess this is maybe the older one, um, this is the future one, but in the plus minus one, two years, we've had a bunch of events right here on campus. Um, where we get sort of researchers from all of Southern California to come here, sometimes even nationally, um, to come here and sort of hang out, spend a day, give talks. And it's really good for graduate students because you get to hang out with sort of the luminaries in the field. Yeah, and this is going to be happening uh, in a month or so. Uh, we also have an AI machine learning seminar, which actually takes place every Monday, where we get uh, a mixture of external visitors and some local faculty and students. So here are some of the recent highlights. Um, I don't know if these names mean much to you, but Russellan is one of the pioneers of deep learning. Uh, UTN has been working at Google DeepMind on sort of AlphaGo, the sort of iterations of AlphaGo that are more recent, and then so on. Okay, so this was kind of an overview of AI machine learning and research, and it's kind of nice to get a good picture, a high level picture, but I do want to give a sort of quick highlight on some of the stuff that I've been doing, uh, but mostly focus on this one project that I think is, is pretty exciting. I'm not going to go into any of the math or the algorithms. I'm happy to chat with you over lunch if you're interested, uh, but I just kind of want to give you an example of what kind of things we are doing. So let's start with a basic problem. If I give you this image and I ask you whether I should adopt this as a pet or not, you might be like, maybe uh, it looks like a wolf, so it shouldn't, but maybe you're not so sure. So hopefully you can train some machine learning model that tells you that it's a wolf and you should not adopt it. That seems good. Um, and hopefully this machine learning model is good, whereas when it sees something that it thinks is not a wolf, it tells you that it's a husky and you can adopt it. And so you can actually set this up pretty easily. It doesn't take a PhD to do this. It takes maybe a course in machine learning and a couple of hours to train a classifier like this that can basically, given a data set, tell you whether each of them is a wolf or a husky. And of course, it won't be perfect. In this case, it makes one mistake. It thinks that this is a wolf, but pretty good, right? Like five out of six, it, it gets it right. I probably won't be able to get anywhere close to this. I'll probably just randomly guess, maybe get four out of six. This is just a simple example. You have much more complicated tasks in machine learning now. So this is a task of visual question answering, where you're given an image, and you can do textual question answering with it. So you can say something like, is there a mustache in this picture? And you may argue with me whether it does or it doesn't, but uh, the machine learning algorithm says yes. And it does that by looking at understanding the question, understanding the image, and figuring out, even though it has never seen a mustache like this before, I hadn't seen one either, uh, it thinks that there is a concept of a mustache here. Now, yes and no seem like a very simple thing. It's a binary choice. So you might be like, maybe that's not so impressive. Actually, you can ask it, what is the mustache made of? And it can say things like banana, right? which means it's actually able to understand that there is a banana in the picture, and it 
the mustache is made of it, even though it has never seen a mustache actually made up of banana. Now, all of this is pretty impressive. The question, though, is, is machine learning doing what we think it is doing? When you think about what the models look like, this is a neural network from maybe 15 years ago, where each of these lines is like a floating point number. How can you figure out what's actually going on here? Let's look at a maybe not 15 years ago, maybe five years ago. This is what a neural network looks like, which doesn't fit horizontally, so it uh, doesn't fit vertically. I have to make it horizontal. And there are these sort of 30 layers here with thousands of weights in every edge that you see here. And now, more recently, there are neural networks that kind of have thousands of layers themselves, each with thousands of weights. So it's kind of getting out of hand. We don't really know what it's doing. Why is that a problem? Well, it turns out I showed you these examples. Um, what I didn't tell you was that actually what this classifier was doing was basically detecting snow. And every time it detected snow, it predicted wolf. And every time it didn't see snow, it predicted husky. And now this mistake kind of makes sense because there is snow here in the background, so it predicts it's a wolf. And it gets it right because this happens to be a husky in a snowy region. And the point is that when we run machine learning algorithms and just look at the output, we somehow attribute intelligence to them, sometimes falsely. And we should be aware a little bit of what they're doing. Oh, OK. Well, that's actually next, so I'll, yeah. We don't know that. We don't know what it realized. Right? We just can ask it a question. We can maybe ask it a question, is there a woman in the picture? It might say yes, or it might say no. Right? But let's go back to this. And when you say, what is the mustache? It says banana. Let's try to ask a few other questions. So we didn't ask the specific question there. But we asked it, what are the eyes made of? And it said banana. Now, that's pretty disappointing because it was doing something very smart here, and suddenly it's not doing some, anything smart. So we asked it, what? And it said, banana. We asked it, what is? It said, banana. And so it turns out that it's looking at the yellow curvy thing, and it's, being ab it's able to say that that's a banana, but it's not doing anything as smart as what we thought it was doing. So I don't want to go into uh, what, how my algorithms actually work, but what we do is we are able to take classifiers, treat them as black boxes. So we did this with Google's inception network, where we didn't have access to the code. And we were able to take why it thinks an image like this has an electric guitar in it. Turns out this is the area it's focusing on. And we are able to figure out what the neural network is focusing on automatically. Here's another example. It thinks there's an acoustic guitar. That seems to be the region. It thinks there's a Labrador, luckily, because there is one. And it thinks it's because of that. So now we can sort of pinpoint why the neural network thinks it's, it's doing some predictions. So again, we did a lot of experiments and stuff with that. But I just kind of want to go back and show you what the explanations look like for this problem. In this case, these are what the explanations look like. Everything that's gray is something the neural network is ignoring. So when it's trying to predict that this is a wolf, it's actually not even looking at the wolf. It's only looking at what's on the floor here. When it's trying to predict whether this is a husky or not, it's only looking at the floor. It's not even looking at the animal itself. And similarly here. right? So you can see every time it predicts wolf, it's mostly just looking at the floor. It's completely ignoring the animal. Uh, we can do this even with sort of more text-like uh, explanations. Where here we are asking why does it think, uh, what does it focus on when it looks at the question, what is the mustache made of? Turns out this thing is bold because it's only looking at the word what. If the question starts with the word what, it always says banana. Here are some of the other questions we asked during the optimization. And you know, what is the man made of? What is this mustache? Anything, it just said banana. And we can do this for other questions also. In this case, we asked it how many bananas are in the picture. It said two. You can see that it's only focusing on many. So if you can ask any of the questions with the word many in it, it just seems to be giving two. Right. So 
What the point I want to make is that when you use machine learning, they do amazing things, but in order to trust it, in order to be able to predict what it'll do when you run it on a system and deploy it in the wild, or even as an engineer, whether you want to improve it, these kind of explanations can actually be incredibly useful. So in conclusion, research highlight aside, going back to UCI, you guys should come here because it's a really great place to live and to do research, especially in machine learning and AI. Outstanding faculty, amazing students. Hopefully you'll get to meet both of them today. Um, and we just have this whole diverse range of things that we cover, which I think makes it more than the sum of our parts. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd like to take them. No, thank you. Welcome to uh, UC Irvine. Uh, are you all primed up to come here yet? That's you, Eli? Oh, I was about to send you an email. <laughs> Honestly, uh, your uh, hosts are sitting in the back. OK. OK, good. So um, I'm going to give you the theory side uh, of uh, work here, um, mostly in algorithms. Uh, and I know Eli is uh, one of the people who's dying to come here. I, I know there are a couple more who are <laughs> theory candidates here. Uh, your name, please? Yeah, Good. And anybody else? OK. She's watching it over the internet. OK. So, uh, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of great work happening here. But let me ask uh, you a trivia question. But it's not a trivial question. Uh, can you name an algorithm that won a Nobel Prize? Do you know that there's no Nobel Prize given for computer science? You know that? Economics, Economics is, yeah, but so name an algorithm. You, I told you about this. <laughs> so so you're, you're not uh, uh, allowed to uh, <laughs> answer this question. But anybody else who knows an algorithm that won a Nobel Prize? OK. Uh, actually, there are two, now that I think of it. Huh? Yeah, the table bag problem. Good. Where do you hear about that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping uh, somebody new would say it. OK, you also would know that uh, linear programming won the Nobel Prize. Uh, so there are two algorithms. So hope's uh, still alive for many of you here. <laughs> Eli included. So yeah, the stable matching problem won the Nobel Prize uh, in 2012, the economics Nobel Prize. What it has to do with economics is a very interesting story. I'll be able to only uh, hint at it. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, in particular, Al Roth is coming here in the fall to give a distinguished lecture. So even more reason for you guys to accept super fast before we get full up. <laughs> OK, so here's the stable marriage problem. So uh, it was uh, defined by Gale and Shapley. Shapley is uh, this amazing economist. Uh, he was at UCLA, uh, but he passed away a couple of years ago after receiving the Nobel Prize. And uh, Gale was uh, an economist and a mathematician at uh, Berkeley. Uh, everybody's Californian here. Uh, Al Roth is at Stanford. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, so uh, Gale was uh, at Berkeley, uh, but passed away before 2012. And you know that uh, Nobel Prizes can be given to three people, but not if they are already uh, passed away. So that's how he missed it out. Uh, anyway, Gale and Shepley defined this amazing, amazing problem. Why do I call it amazing, amazing? Uh, sorry, I left my two books here. One moment. Yeah, the green bag. Thank you, Mark. So, uh, so uh, here's the problem. Uh, given uh, n boys and n girls, each boy has a complete preference list for over all the girls. He likes this one, then this one, and this one, then this one. Then number two boys likes this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. Similarly, the girls also give preference lists over all the n boys, complete preference lists, and the object 
of the algorithm is to pair boys with girls, n boys with n girls, one each boy with one girl, uh, so that no boy-girl pair wants to succeed from this pairing. When will a boy-girl pair succeed? If they are not paired, but they like each other more than whoever they were their, their assigned mates are by the algorithm. So the, the algorithm tells this boy, you should mate up with this, and the, this girl, you should, you're the mate of this boy, and this boy-girl pair like each other better than, so they say, you know, to hell with you and your algorithm, we are going off on our own. And they are both have incentive to you know, disappear, right? elope. So you don't want that to happen. This will be unstable. So if there is no such uh, boy-girl pair, then the, the matching is called, the pairing is called stable. Now, <coughs> first question that arises is, is there even a stable marriage? Because I told you that these uh, preference lists are arbitrary. They are designed by boys and girls. Uh, you know, they are each boy and each girl got a piece of paper, and they have to just list their end girls uh, in some order. They never thought about uh, whether there's a, going to be a, a stable ma um, pairing or not. And how many people think there that there is always a stable pairing, and how many people think that sometimes yes, sometimes no, and so how many people think that never? So, one, two, three. Always, sometimes, never. Uh, can I do a vote of people who have not heard about this problem before? Okay, so two people are already excluded from that. Always, nobody. Uh, sometimes, okay, good. Never, and no opinion, and will not answer. Okay, so nobody said the first answer, which is the correct one. Always. Always. Always? Why? Always why? OK, very hard, very hard question to answer. Uh, turns out the answer comes from an algorithm. And the algorithm was given by these people, which finally won the Nobel Prize. Okay? You give an algorithm which, given any set of lists in polynomial time, meaning very efficiently, gives you a stable marriage. Always. Never fails. Okay. And this problem has numerous, numerous applications. Uh, uh, placing interns in hospitals, you know, after people graduate from hospitals, uh, 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 sorry, after they graduate from, with their uh, uh, medicine degrees, they go and apply for internships. And uh, uh, each person has lots of, you know, parameters, like I want to be, I li love the snow, and I love your, the snow storms, and, uh, I want to be inundated by the worst possible weather, so I want to go to Boston, right? And somebody says, no, no, I want the best possible weather. I want to come to Irvine, or, or whatever else their criteria are. Maybe not just weather, but also you know, what they want to specialize in, and uh, where are their fair friends, and where, where is their family, and so on. So each uh, intern has a, a bunch of uh, uh, desire, desired locations, maybe in some order. And each hospital has some desired interns, because this, this hospital says, oh, I want to get a, another uh, a neurologist, trained neurologist, and train them better. Or I want uh, an X kind of a doctor. So they also have their desires, and then you want to pair them up somehow. Or uh, you want to place students in high school, and this is uh, being used all the time in New York City, because they have uh, thousands of students and hundreds of schools, and uh, uh, students have uh, choices over schools, they want certain types of schools, and schools have uh, you know, desires over which students they want because of their grades or their extracurricular activities or, or their ethnicity or who knows what, and so how to pair them up. Hun thousands of students over hundreds of uh, schools. So there's an algorithm, efficient algorithm that does that. Okay. Now going back to the Nobel Prize citation. It was awarded for the theory of stable allocations, that's stable marriage, and the practice of market design. Market design. What is a market? As far as you know, that's a market, right? It's always been like that, even today. Maybe, you know, slightly uh, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, a few uh, iPhones thrown in and uh, 
maybe a few carts instead of uh, people carrying uh, fruit on their heads. Uh, but that's the market, right? No, there are many other markets. Okay, There is something called matching markets. And this is one such matching market. This is a matching market. This is a matching market. These are matching markets where you match off, uh, say, buyers and sellers of houses. That's a matching market. Each person has desires, and uh, uh, sellers have uh, you know, desired amount that they want. Buyers have uh, many, many kinds of different desires. And how do you match them up? And uh, this, there are big algorithmic questions here, huge. Okay? And that's what Al Roth uh, is famous for matching markets. In particular, he's very famous for his work on kidney exchange market. Now, why should there be a market for exchanging kidneys, real kidneys? Not, I'm not joking. These are real kidneys taken out of people. Okay? What happens? So, so people, many people, hundreds and thousands of people in this country every year, they, both their kidneys stop functioning. So they have to do dialysis of their uh, blood every few hours, and it's very painful to live in that condition. Even if they got one kidney, they would have a decent life. Now, it turns out everybody has two kidneys, right? But they don't need two. They need only one. So this guy... Uh, he has two bad kidneys. He says to his wife, you know, please give me one of your kidneys. And she says, okay. So they go to the doctor and they, they realize that, no, her kidney is not compatible because of the blood type or many other reasons. Okay, there are many factors that go into making a kidney. You know, transplanting an, an internal organ is not easy. You have to be, it, it has to be completely com compatible to your system, right? So they say, no, she cannot give it. So he found a donor, okay, and still the, the exchange cannot happen. But his uh, next door neighbor is in the same situation, okay. He also found a donor, or she, she found a donor, namely her husband, okay, and there again it's an incompatible kidney. But what happens is that these two pairs get together, and this person's kidney goes to this. And this person's kidney goes to this, and that's compatible. Turns out that's compatible. OK? Got it? OK. But you may not be able to find two, two pairs like that. OK? You may have to find uh, eight pairs, maybe, so that this kidney goes to this, this to this, this to this, 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 and you finally complete the cycle. So there are eight patients who found eight donors, all incompatible. But if you do this exchange in a cycle, everything works out. Well, so there's a huge uh, algorithmic question here. Uh, in particular, how do you find the smallest such cycle, and how do you look for compatibilities and all that? And the world record is today is 30, uh, 35 pairs. Why, is this, why should this number be small? Because all these patients and uh, donors had to be in the same hospital at the same time in adjacent rooms. Okay. And there are doctors operating on all these 35 pairs, 70 people. From 35 of them, they get kidneys. And somebody runs across the hallway with a kidney and gives it to a patient. And quickly, the doctors uh, sew it up and uh, out they are all ready to go. That's how it happens, because kidneys cannot be kept for very long. So you, have, you want to minimize this. So there's a lot of beautiful algorithmic questions that come in here. And uh, there are many, many issues of an economic incentive compatibility, game theoretic nature. And uh, many people are studying this. Anyway, Al Roth is going to give a very interesting talk on this in the fall. Then there is uh, this company. I don't know if you heard of its name. Uh, it's called Google. How many people have heard of its name? You have? Wh who hasn't? Yeah, so please Google the name tonight. <laughs> okay. So when you get back home, please. So uh, what's, uh, you know what Google is, right? Google. I mean, every few minutes you're on Google, right? Doing something or the other. Who pays for all the work that you're doing on Google? Google is spending billions of dollars hiring uh, engineers, uh, hiring bandwidth, hiring computers. I mean, running computers to, to do your searches, to do your email. Who's paying for it? Do you know who's paying for it? Other companies. Which company? The ones that apply ads to them to search. 
right this is the market that uh, that supports almost single handedly almost all of google's revenue and profits and google uh, which started at uh, a market cap of 27 billion dollars in 2004 today has a market cap of you know how much more than 1 trillion and 100 billion so more than a trillion dollars this company is worth because of this one market this one market and it's a, it's all uh, in your imagination there's no goods here the, i cannot buy books there i cannot all i all it is is you know what this market is uh, when you type in a, a a keyword like this viox google gives you uh, pages relevant to this keyword and also gives you uh, ads that that advertisers want shown with such a keyword. Okay, these, these guys have actually bid some money to be out there. Okay, what kind of people would you expect there uh, to bid for a, a drug like Vioxx? Pharmaceuticals, right? What do you see there? Lawyers, because, uh, because uh, Vioxx uh, had uh, caused many problems to people. And so there were many, many lawsuits against Merck, which had uh, launched Vioxx. And uh, these law lawyers, if they get a, a patient, if they attract the attention of such a patient, they can reap uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars from them, right? if the se lawsuit settles positively. So these guys, these lawyers, are happy to pay $50 to be here. $50, what, what happens is, if a patient who's looking for a lawyer clicks here, then $50 goes from this lawyer's account to Google's account. That's how it happens. That's how Google makes its revenue. Okay? So obviously, Google wants to maximize its revenue, so it should place uh, the highest bidder up here, the second highest bidder up here, because this is the most clicked spot, and so on and so forth. Right? But life is not as simple as that, because these advertisers have not only uh, said what their bids are for these keywords, but also they have set a daily budget. Namely, today I don't want more than $200 worth of ads or $5,000 more, more than, more than $5,000 worth of ads. And if you don't pay as an upper bound, maybe you'll go bankrupt within a day, right? So, so how do you take this into account, the daily budget? Turns out this is a big story and uh, it has to be addressed in a very nice way. And this is the work that we did uh, in 2005 to uh, address this problem theoretically using algorithms. And we gave a very simple algorithm uh, that has been adapted by Google and all the other online search industry. So it has uh, really reaped in a huge, it has had a huge impact. And uh, there are hundreds of papers written uh, following up on this paper from 2005. This is another one of these matching markets because we are matching uh, uh, advertisers to uh, to uh, que uh, 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 query words, query rather query words to advertisers. So there's, there's a lot of work going on along all these fronts here. Uh, many people are so this is a very algorithms heavy uh, department, uh, but the algorithms are all very exciting and uh, uh, it's a very high class, very high quality uh, department for th theoretical computer science. Even if you're not going to do theory, you learn uh, through the, some of the required courses or even optional courses a lot of very nice uh, uh, stuff that will be valuable to, for your uh, career. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. Welcome. My name is Amari Lewis. I'm a second year PhD student. I work in theory group with um, Amelia Regan is my advisor. And welcome to the graduate student panel. 
Hi, my name is Yuno. Uh, I'm a, a fourth year PhD student. Uh, I'm working with uh, Magda Elzarki. Um, uh, my research is more about the uh, developing a game and the cloud platform to support that uh, for motivating the exercise for young kids. Um, okay, two more yeah, coming. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's take your seat. Look for others. Okay, um, hi, uh, my name is Sabur. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student here. I work with Professor Marco Leverato. And uh, my research area is more uh, like wireless communications and uh, networking in IoT, um, urban IoT to be specific. And recently, um, for past one year, we have been working with drones, so trying to be cool and doing cool <laughs> things. <laughs> so <laughs> if you are interested, so just um, ask me anything about that or any other questions in general. <laughs> Hi, my name is Zahra Montazeri. Uh, I'm third year PhD in computer graphics and I'm working in rendering, visualization, simulation stuff. Um, let me know if you have any question about graphics group. Here we have three faculties for the group and uh, any general question living in SoCal about UCI, anything else. Feel free to ask any question from us. We are happy to help. First, who is the brave one? <laughs> if you don't have questions, then we have to ask you questions. Yeah. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we can start generally talking about. Yeah, I'll start with um, with my first year. So I started my PhD directly after bachelor's. Some of, some of you might have the same experience. It would be a bit overwhelming for you at first that you feel that you are behind the schedule. <laughs> Everyone has some experience in research and they already know what is research and how to write a paper and so on. And it would be a bit scary for you, but it's typically not. So it's a good, it's even better to start uh, directly after your bachelor's, I would say, because then you would have more time for exploring what you're gonna what you're gonna choose for your PhD thesis. You will have enough time to explore different fields and so on. Uh, so f yeah, that's true. That for the first two years, you should have um, you would have a lot of courses to study for. You would you would have less time for your research compared to those that they come from masters. And yes, you need to spend more time to, to get along with research because it's new for you compared to those that they have the research already in, your, in their masters. Uh, so, but it is pretty much the same. You, for the first two years here at ICS, you need to pass seven courses if you have already a master and 11 courses if you are not, if you don't have a master. And it typically takes one, one and a half or two years for pa passing the courses while doing research. Um, yeah, I would pass it over, but uh, I don't know about uh, I, I know about her, but if any question about starting from bachelor's, let me know. Um, okay, um, just um, starting from the same place. So um, actually, I did masters before PhD, so I had to take many less courses, a uh, few courses to compensate for the uh, like required ones. And um, but um, as a PhD student, I took a topic uh, at the beginning. Um, which uh, did not produce much results, so I had to change the topic. So that's pretty common also. Um, I mean, not maybe too common, but that happens to many PhD students that you change the topic on the course um, maybe after six months, um, change the I mean, topic or the project as such, and move to something else. But um, the advisors are pretty helpful. They will guide you that um, when, when to... Actually, you have to be proactive as well um, and with your advisor, but they are very helpful too. Uh, to um, choose what is best for you. And uh, usually in first, after two years time, um, if you have done masters, then you have to do the advancement to candidacy exam. So for um, that, it's just like here in UC, uh, like ICS, I think you, have, you don't have a written exam as such or some, uh, 
some probably specializations do have in data science. Other than that, other than that you have to just defend um, your proposal in front of a committee and um, then uh, when, as, like when you are done with the advancement, then, then you can continue with your work. So that's most about it. Yeah. Yeah, I had a similar experience as, as her. I came directly from bachelor's degree, um, and the transition for me was a little hard because I came from a semester system to quarter system, and uh, so the classes are a lot you know, faster in that regard. So maybe you're coming from quarter system, so you might be fine with it. Um, the course load, as she stated before, is 11 courses uh, without your um, master's, and a lot of them are very hands-on, project-based, so don't try to take bite more than you can chew like don't take too many courses at one time uh, just fill out what you need and what you can um, can uh, take because they're very demanding courses they're kind of like thesis work <laughs> in 10 weeks or eight weeks and then the last two weeks are kind of like finishing the papers or presentations in the projects a lot of group work so that's a good thing about our department there's a lot of group work um, and the group work is better than undergrad group work. You're not going to be doing all the work on your own. Just you're going to disperse the work um, based on what um, you guys are familiar with, what your capabilities are in, in the department, computer science, like whatever you feel more comfortable doing, like coding, programming, or whatever. Um, also, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, TA ship. So if you have to TA um, or be a reader, uh, find out. Uh, because that's important as well, because you have to take a required course for TAing. Um, and TAing also is demanding. So if you're TAing, don't take three classes and TA, because it's you won't have time to sleep. Um, <laughs> you really won't. Uh, the classes, the undergrad classes are pretty big. Um, so yeah, when I was a first, my first quarter, I was a reader, which is kind of like the, a TA assistant um, grading papers and helping out the professor with making the exams and the key for the exams. Um, in the class that I was working with, Boolean algebra was like 500 students. So I was like, wow, this is a huge class. Um, I came from a smaller university, so I wasn't used to that. Um, so a lot of grading and a lot of scanning of the exams. We use an online system called Gradescope to do our grading. But regardless, it takes up a lot of time. So just be sure to know what you need to, what's required of you based on your funding um, in your first couple of years. How many readers do you have? How many readers do we have? I think it was like two and then two lead TAs. Like for 500 students? Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. Uh, the size of the uh, the number of the TAs and the readers are actually uh, depending on the number of the students. Uh, right. Each class. So, so for example, uh, if the uh, students, uh, number of students are more than 100, then um, usually school are locating one or two, uh, at least two readers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if the uh, size of the class goes above like 400, then I guess um, they are locating four, uh, yeah. four or five. So, yeah, yeah, yeah if you're- like, uh, like per TA probably 80 students mm -hmm. kind of roughly allocated. So you have to grade 80 papers. I had to be a class of 40 and I thought that was too much. Oh, oh, it's uh, not too much. Believe me, you are lucky to get 40. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. You so basically, it should take you 20 hours. It yes. roughly yes. takes 20 hours a week. Pick it up. It, it, it typically... No, no, uh, does it pick it up? Oh, yeah. yeah. Up. I think we can leave it over there. Okay, yeah. Okay. Is that okay? okay? So it's supposed to be 20 hours a week, but it usually takes like between 10 or 15. Um, and you, you're not uh, supposed to work more than 20 hours a week because it's a part-time job. So it's not that bad compared to the, the payment. Uh, it's more <laughs> about like when the work is happening. Yeah. So uh, usually uh, we're actually grading or helping people. I mean, depending on the positions, either like TA or the readers. Uh, for TAs, they are supposed to uh, face more students. Mm -hmm. For the readers, they are more like uh, graders. Mm -hmm. So. Depending on the positions, uh, the time when the you know the work is actually jamming into is going to be different. So um, for TA shift so far, uh, experience so far, um, you are more like uh, uh, you can um, have a little bit more flexible times, uh, having less stress on the certain period of times. Uh, but uh, the the cons, the process is about it. But the cons is it's more about uh, you have to spend uh, uh, three, four hours each week 
um, at uh, certain places or age groups. Uh, for graders, usually I spend like 20 hours uh, within a day to gr finish up the one grading, like piece, grading piece one or grading piece two, because there's a, some sort of like deadline to unload the uh, scores of scores. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's t totally and it depends random, on the, prof yeah. the professor as well. Yes. Some professors have um, <coughs> homework assignments. Some don't, and some will just put all this on you and want you to do all your twenty hours in one day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because um, they might have two midterms and, and, and a final, or they might have one midterm and a final. It just depends on the course. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it just depends, and uh, you know how some. So for your first <laughs> quarter, maybe you won't have any idea what yeah. uh, course you can pick or you can uh, put in your preference list. But later, you can ask around mm -hmm. what courses, I wouldn't say light, but uh, it's better it's better <laughs> fitted with your uh, with yes. your interest, at least, because you're going to yeah. spend some time of your week during for that. So you can ask around what courses. And then in advance, you can ask the instructor that can I be your TA? So in that case, you would have more chance to be TA or reader for that particular course. Otherwise, you will be assigned randomly. You would have the preference list uh, submitted um, in advance, but it would be higher chance if you can talk with an advisor or the instructor, if you want, if you really want to be TA. Uh, I was wondering, uh, a couple of us So I'll repeat his question yeah. because he, we, we didn't capture oh, your question. Like, yeah, I, I just, I, I okay, you can repeat your question. So I, I'm from, um, my bachelor was in electronics and communication engineering. So it. it's not really, <laughs> <laughs> really like, about, like, Different from computer science, but yeah, like usually if you are uh, coming from a different background, you need to take certain uh, prerequisite courses, they call. So basically, um, like some courses uh, to align with the CS, you need to take like undergrad level courses probably in CS. And then once you pass that, then only uh, you, you can take the advanced course for uh, like the respective courses. So a so few extra prerequisite courses you may need to go through. That's it. I think the, oh, do yeah. you want to add anything? No, I came from CS background. Um, regardless, you're just going to have to take some courses. Um, and if you want to catch up, if you want a full understanding, I would advise you to go beyond the prereqs and just take some things that you want to learn, um, just so that you can do that. Hold and can answer the question. Oh, okay. So uh, I actually uh, got a two degrees for, uh, from the uh, undergrads. Uh, my main major is mathematics, and I double major computer science later on. So um, you probably has a concern about like uh, having certain uh, good skills in computer science specific, such as like codings. Uh, well, yeah. to make it short, um, it quite depends on what you wanna, where you wanna go. So if the uh, area you wanna pursue uh, for um, extending your knowledge too, then um, if if that area requires like lots of source code uh, coding, making source coding then you require the coding. Other than that, uh, well, yeah, for, uh, for some uh, areas, such as more like graphics and those areas, those areas, you, you need a little bit more knowledge in the mathematics. So for example, so I, I don't know. Uh, well, if you know where you want to go, then uh, you can actually uh, shorten the uh, period of time to prepare to be more uh, computer science ready. So. Uh, I guess you still have time for uh, going to the PhD program, right? So uh, before that time, uh, you can actually uh, go into the certain uh, uh, classes or you can take uh, online courses to, to be a little bit more prepared for it. Um, and once you actually go in, uh, went to the uh, PhD program, enter the PhD program, there are certain uh, classes ready so you can actually take uh, to uh, yeah. get some ideas on. So yeah, and there will be classes you can audit also here. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily you have to enroll. Mm -hmm. So you can just sit in any class. Um, maybe you take pro permission from the professor or instructor, and you can just sit in any class. I in fact, in any department, most probably, if you take permission ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh. Thank you.
of the um, having to take um, 11 classes or pass 11 classes before a uh, PhD, um, are those 11 required? I mean, um, like, are certain classes required, or is it just you choose whatever you want? Excellent question. There's a catalog online, and follow that to the T. There's a, there's a catalog online. You follow it to the T. So um, everything's already mapped out. So there's four core classes and seven electives. Um, the four core classes have to be in four different areas of computer science of the listed, like, seven areas. Mm -hmm. um, so that is your platform. Um, you can take electives in all of ICS, which encompassing of statistics, informatics, computer science, yeah. So I've taken some informatics uh, electives. Yeah, they're really cool. So you have that platform. And if you want to take a class outside of your major, I mean outside of your department, like in engineering or something, you're welcome to do that as well. You just have to have permission and signatures and stuff. But it's all online, so don't, yeah. But the core classes are standard. Electives are more flexible. Yes. One thing oh, yeah. about THU, I just remember uh, that you didn't mention, it's about um, the international, for international students, that you, if you want to be TA, you have to pass an uh, a English course, English class, basically. Uh, so for PhD students, ICS department has the requirement of being TA twice for, for the whole PhD program. Uh, so that requirement is better to do it early in your PhD because later on you would have the RA, which is the research assistant uh, funding from your advisor. So it's better to be TA in your first or two, uh, second year of your PhD. And for getting your TA ship, if you are international student, you have to pass the course. Uh, there would be two type of uh, English uh, exams that you have to take an, a, a limit number of a grade in order to pass that course. Wait, do you have to actually take the course? Or do you uh, there, would be, there would be a limit. It depends. Uh, if you, your listening of your TOEF is on a, above 26, then you don't need to at all. You're already passed, basically. But if it's, um, if it's under 26, but upper some other limit, you have to take uh, only the exam, but other than that, you have to take the course and the exam afterward. So there would be some things, but just have it in mind that if you are an international student and you're looking for being TA, you have to pass the English exam. Uh, yes. Are you expected to take only electives that are in line with your research, or could you do stuff that might be interesting and isn't directly related to research, or is that frowned upon, or how, how does that work exactly? Um, actually, you can take um, any, um, any elective course as such, but um, usually, um, like, people don't take some co something which is not exact, like, remotely related even um, to your thing. Like, if you want, say, taking a music class, for example. Within the school, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, within the school, you, you are probably allowed to take anything. Um, like I, I took a statistics course also, even if I'm not using that much, but I learned how to use R. And even for a single research, I didn't use that tool yet, but I just took that course, just wanted to learn. So yeah, for, for within the school, everything is open. Well, as, as, I, uh, as, as we already talk about, uh, TA ship readerships are taking 50% of your time already. And uh, within other 50% of time, you have to do uh, research. And at the same time, you may have to take courses, yeah. right? And if you have a family, you have, <laughs> uh, it's one, different, yeah, one it costs different. That thing is, again, coming back to the auditing the class. Mm -hmm. If you want to say, just learn, but don't want to take a workload of exams and midterms and assignments, yeah. then you can just go ahead and sit in the class, take permission ahead, and just want to learn, and but don't want to take the workload for exams and assignments. So you are welcome to do that. And usually, uh, before taking courses, mm -hmm. you may be want to uh, discuss that issue with your advisor. Yeah. Because our um, uh, advisor has more um, control over what you are actually doing for next uh, few hours or next few weeks or next few years. So uh, yeah, so if advisor allows, then you can actually take courses. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, 
master's students and bachelors have different course requirements? Is that is that just the number? Like, is it uh, fixed or is it? Master's degree and no, no. Like, if I'm coming from masters or if I'm coming from bachelors, yeah. you I said that I would. So basically, like, uh, I came after masters. So, um, yeah. So if you have. If you have come after master's degree, then you have two choices. Either you can waive off maximum three courses from your previous university. And no, then if you want to take a second master's from here, that path is still open. But if you want to take, uh, if you want to waive off the entire master's degree that you already pursued and just want to proceed with PhD degree, then you can waive off the master's degree itself. Just taking, like you have to do a course map, like UCI requirement versus your uh, previous universities, and say one or two courses doesn't match, I mean, that they do not match, then you need, need to just take all those two courses. And then you can waive off the master's degree itself. But in that scenario, you won't be able to get a terminal, terminal master's degree on the course of PhD. You will be just getting the PhD. But otherwise, you, ha you will have an option of having uh, another master's degree from UCI. Now, what's the advantage of having another master's degree? Some people take it for um, like international students. They want to do internships, so OPT period gets renewed. And so those things happen at every degree level. So that has some advantages. Otherwise. If you want to pursue PhD, so you just go for PhD. Yeah, many people. Yeah. No, you get an OPT. Oh, no, your master's level OPT will be bounded by, yeah. So OPT level are, um, OPT like periods are degree level specific. So at every degree level, it gets renewed. So if you waive off the master's, yeah. you don't have to take seven courses or 11? No. No, I am no. It's uh, like three, four courses probably, and you can waive off the master's degree. Yeah. Can I just add something to the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Like but it says nothing about that being a but master's many courses degree. you can map from your previous universities that you think okay. that you already have done. So if you're coming with a master but in a math background, then you would probably can have map to take like another, yeah. two of them at yeah. most. But if you are already have your master in CS, then you can maybe have like four or five of them already matched. So it depends what is your master background, if you can uh, get the credit for those that you already passed or not. Yeah, I think uh, out of four core courses, you need three at least matched. Mm -hmm. And out of some uh, electives, like seven, you need to get maybe five matched. Then only you, you'll be eligible to like wave off the MS. Otherwise, so 50% you have to, you cannot take like 50% satisfying and waving off a degree. So it's just I have some more questions about the whole terminal master's. Uh -huh. I, I don't know if I should do that. I think you can, you can talk to me later yeah, because yeah, we are bounded by time. Maybe some other question. Non-academic questions, anything? <laughs> Housing related questions? Uh, oh yeah, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, during the PhD you can take a master's degree also. Uh, no, you, you just need to file for it um, yeah. in the graduate division to get a degree with you. But nothing would change, like, on the course of PhD. Okay. So you can, you can get a hood ceremony if you want for master's also. Master's it's uh -huh. thesis for master's? Uh, th that's optional. It's non thesis, um, if you don't have a thesis, then you have to go through a comprehensive exam, I guess. Yes. So that's an yeah. alternate of thesis. And I think you have to pass three comprehensive exams. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there would be either three comprehensive exam or four. Uh, it depends if it's the research-based master or the course-based. Mm -hmm. For the course-based, uh, you have to complete those eleven courses. That four of them are the core courses, and you have to. So basically, for the let me use this. This is pretty important. <laughs> <laughs> so for the comprehensive exam that we are talking about is basically the final exam of that course that you're already taking. So it's nothing and not, not a separate exam. It's basically the final exam of that 
course you have to get like a or whatever there would be a there would be a grade that will be announced by the instructor at the first session of the course that if you're pursuing for getting master then you have to get a out of this course and then if you get a then that will be counted as your comprehensive exam and if you complete three of them um, or four of them without thesis then you're done so basically nothing extra than your phd you will get it on the way yes Well, I guess uh, three of us are actually from ICS department, um, uh, pursuing ICS uh, PhD program, uh, but I am from Network Systems, which is uh, one of the programs, interdisciplinary uh, program between ICS and ECS program. So uh, for that specific programs, we have a slightly different uh, uh, requirements we have to meet, such as like uh, 11 courses. Uh, I guess we have 12 or less. Uh, and uh, we don't actually have to do a, a comprehensive exam, but we are being asked to write a you know, report about like one of the seminars we, we actually attended uh, out of, let's say, uh, 12 seminars for a year. So um, it quite depends on what program you are in. Uh, I guess we have informatics, network systems, and statistics programs in under ICS pro, uh, department. So um, you may want to go check the uh, website to get the policy and the requirements and ca ca um, catalog, catalog yeah, yeah, can help you too. Yeah, yeah. That's very true. Do you have questions? His question was, can your master's thesis be extended to your PhD thesis? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. But if, if you change your advisor, probably usually the topic changes, like maybe on the same area, but yeah, something. But, but if you want, you can, of course, talk to your advisor that you want to work in the similar area and continue. should be different because um, I wrote a uh, master thesis from different uh, lab. Um, um, the expectation of the uh, uh, master thesis and the uh, expectation of the PhD thesis are really different. Uh, being said, the, um, uh, some of the professors are expecting, expecting writing one single paper to finish up the master thesis. But I believe at least to uh, write up the uh, PhD thesis or we call it dissertation, mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to actually write it up, you maybe want to at least publish three papers, and one should be uh, on uh, like journal level of the uh, knowledges. Um, it depends on the advisor. Yeah, sure. It really depends on the advisor. But um, usually, um, the PhD dissertation is supposed to and expected to have like that much of knowledges you know, jammed in uh, that you know, paper. Uh, I mean yeah, and quantity of papers is kind of uh, subjective mm -hmm. and depends on the uh, like um, advisors. But it's more like they want uh, they want depth that you can present the work outside of this school anywhere in other school or any industry, and they may uh, see that okay there is something uh, that they can acquire from your uh, thesis. So it's it's kind of something very like well depth and yeah, yeah so those the things the are. The expectation is really different simply because master students are supposed write uh, their thesis within a quarter or two. But the uh, PhD program is not two quarter program. It's more like a three years, four years, five years, or six years, you know, uh, um, and study. So, of course, yeah. Since we're running out of time, we would maybe briefly mention about hou housing, if you have any question. Um, so I would just roughly say about uh, graduate housing here, there would be uh, three uh, complex, Verona Place, um, all over there, and Vista del Campo. yeah, Vista del Campo, that you can pick in advance uh, any of them that you want to be. So the, the good point is that UCI offers graduate housing for, for graduate students, not, not other UCs or other schools, but here in SoCal is pretty expensive if you want to go off campus. 
So try to not, not miss the application deadline for uh, submitting your housing if you want to live on campus. Uh, and if you want to have this in mind, that if you're going to find a, a place off campus, have this in mind that public transportation in Irvine is pretty weak. So you have to have a car if you are living off campus. Uh, so don't count on any public transportation, I would say. Or uh, there is a, uh, another type of transportation available on okay. campus is the uh, zip car, uh, where you can actually rent cars uh, by hours, or by uh, hour based. Uh, it's kind of ten dollars. Uh, it's ten dollars an hour. I guess uh, it was like five years ago. By the way, <laughs> uh, but uh, it should be very similar now. Uh, so you can actually apply for the programs. Um, uh, then, uh, if you are qualified to use that uh, service, maybe you can actually use that out. Um, um, oh. And uh, child care. I have a family. I guess none of you actually have any experience no. of it. Um, I have a family. I have a daughter, four years old, uh, old do uh, daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, UCI actually has a pretty good season for child care. I guess you probably have a family in the middle of the PhD, maybe. Uh, may maybe not. <laughs> but. Um, um, there are uh, majorly two uh, child care systems. One is uh, University of Montessori, which is uh, up there, like in, in the University Hill area. Um, other than that, there is like four different uh, child care uh, schools, uh, child care ca cen centers. Uh, and each centers are actually having a different range of the ages they're taking care of. Um, and um, um, once you, uh, uh, once you, uh, yeah, about the insurance. Um, we are running out of time. So. Uh, we will be here if you have any questions. Sure, yeah. Now, but cause, uh, cause I don't know, maybe other people will come here or, or if it's recording, we should wrap up. Uh, but we will be here, feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.